to on, on her text. And uh, I've never published or read this in English before, so it's a little, a little weird. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Nelly Arcan um, was actually born Isabelle Fortier in Lac Mégantic in the eastern townships of Quebec. She was born in 1973, and she died in 2009. She wrote a huge amount of books, essays, novels. Uh, she was a journalist, and uh, she wrote a lot about um, sex work. She wrote about what it is to be in a female body, to be judged by other people, namely males. Um, and she was a really unique, brilliant person whose work was really maligned for a long time because of her experience with sex work um, and also because she was really classically beautiful. And I think that both those things really played um, in a way to diminish her, the validity of her work. So anyway, uh, but, but it hasn't, obviously, hasn't remained that way and she is really great. Sorry, I can't see anybody. I'm nervous, so I'm rambling. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is my essay, translating Burka de Char. I only saw Nelly Arcan read once. <clears throat> it was at Montreal's Blue Metropolis Literary Festival in 2003 or 2004. She was reading from her first book, Putain, in some transient open space of a hotel. The space, an entry or a hallway, I can't remember, had been demarcated by folding screens. I'd rushed into the reading right late and had to sit between two of these screens. I watched Arcan read in profile out of the corner of my eye. There have been many much-needed media debates of late surrounded discussion, surrounding discussions of women writers, how so-called objective journalists describe their our appearance, how this sexualizes them, us, segregates them, us, from their our male counterparts, and feeds the machine that renders women constantly, unavoidably consumable to the male gaze. It's true. It's a rampant, lazy, misogynist habit that limits and maligns the way we think of one another. Yet I would not be honest if I didn't say how struck I was by Arcan's physical presence. I remember what she wore as much as I remember her reading a scene from Putain where the protagonist's mother picks repetitively at a cuticle. As much as I remember the way the late afternoon light filtered into the room and the cold temperature of that day. Arcan wore jeans, a crisp white shirt and black high-heeled boots. She sat straight backed in a tall stool while she read. Her hair shone brilliant platinum, and it was coiffed not unlike Marilyn Monroe's iconic dew, with a swishy wave over her forehead. Her presence, at once remote and powerful, radiated the strength of her character and reflected the hype that surrounded her intelligent analysis of her experiences. Specifically, the fact that she was reading from a book that fictionalized her experience with sex work quietly, plainly, you could even call it privately. But there was also the fact of her very real magnetic beauty at play. She was nervy and electric in a way few people are that everyone in the audience was hanging on her words, all the while considering the nature of the work was pal palpable. I wondered how a person could stomach being the focus of such a titillated audience, even as I was part of it. Writers aren't usually, uh, sorry, gen writers aren't generally used to being looked at. We know from her writing how difficult it was for her to bear up under that public scrutiny, but that day it didn't show. Of course, being objectified was something she thought about, something she wrote about in her singular signature raw fashion. Twinning of sex and literature is a theme that very much defined her writing, which is as lyrical as it is blunt, as anecdotal as it is profound. Arcan's work, beginning with Putain and ending with Burka de Char, her posthumous collection of writings published in 2009, and every book, column, or article she penned in between addresses sex, pornography, materialism, prostitution, family, and relationships with an almost obsessive circuitous intent. Arcan's creative nonfiction, her ici, her texts, explore beauty and repugnance in all of the social structures of what it is to be seen as female. To a certain extent, I've identified with Arcan's work all these years, not only because I, we are both women writers from Quebec of the same generation, but also because I, I know what it is to feel the curious revulsion for your acts and to write about them as objectively, subjectively, as judgmentally as possible. To no longer try to behave as if you were trying, you're going to be anything other than your experience, your class, your fears to be, in a sense, an anthropologist of your shame, and to pick at it and dig it up, to transform it with your writing into a kind of matter-of-fact vulnerability. But there are many reasons Arcan's work has been a beacon for me over the years. Some are details, like the, the way that Putain, the book Arcan read from that day I saw her at Blue Metropolis, deals baldly and unsparingly with the mundane gestures that surround the, the life of sex work. A visit to the gynecologist's office, spending hooking cash on Chanel makeup at a ritzy department store in Montreal, 
That particular scene stayed with me for years, undoubtedly because I used to work at Ogilvy's, and it's a scene Achkan read aloud to us that day. Having grown up poor, I, knew, I know what it is to purchase a few iconic tokens of the wealthy, how luxurious objects um, are both iconic and trivial in loves. Some of the reasons I identify with her work are more thematic. I was an editor for Playboy for several years. My cubicle where I wrote and edited texts about March Madness and NASCAR and how to win the dating game was in the thick of the adult industry. I was couched in an office where about 600 people, probably lots of you worked there, um, <laughs> edited porn. It was hilarious, absurd. It was a difficult place to be a woman, to be a woman boss. The experience of working there made me realize the extent to which porn is a machine of the patriarchy. I felt more or less affair about the subject before I worked there, very live and let live. Afterwards, I couldn't undo the hours, the cubicles and cubicles of bronze, silicone breasts and lips, the depressing porn star Twitter accounts, the conversations with designers, what are you up to? I'm editing the shit stains from this girl's ass. I'm making her look like she's in pain. My boss's early morning disgusting summations of the kind of labias he hated, the rotation upon hundreds, thousands of women. The very wrote machinery of subjugation and objectification. My close-up look at sex work, while certainly not the same as Achkan's, is something I can't unsee. It stays with me. I translated a great deal of Achkan's collection, Burka de Cher, at a motel in Rivière du Loup. I take breaks from it in the afternoon and walk along the St. Lawrence, watching the migrating geese congregate along the shores and shallows of that lunar gray-blue landscape. And then I'd get back to my generic motel room. It's that motel right beside the Saint Hubert and back to Arcan's work, sorry, Arcan's dark serpentine sentences. I'd gnaw over her harrowing passage on sex and suicide, exhausted and excited by her work, and wondering how English readers would handle all the commas. Burka de Char includes an essay called La Déshabille, or The Negligé in English, where Arcan speaks about hooking, the hooking money she'll leave her mother after her death, and about her body wasting away, about the isolation of internet porn, and about her eventual death. It's deeply moving, it speaks candidly and viciously about suicide in ways I don't often read in Anglo-American, Anglo-Canadian writing. Nothing about it is polite or gentle or sparing. It hurts to read it. It was a difficult time to, for me to think so much about death. I thought a lot about suicide myself that year. My dad had just died, it was messy, he lived a messy life, and I'd been stuck bearing the brunt of it. I felt so much empathy for the pain Arkan describes. They say women don't usually hang themselves when they commit suicide. The statistics prove that men are more likely to kill themselves in public, dramatic fashions, throwing themselves from bridges beneath metros. Women take pills, slit their wrists, or drown themselves. We don't want to cause any trouble, even when we're extinguishing ourselves. In September 2009, Nelly Arcan hung herself, like a man, like a convict, like a person who wanted to get the job done right. Whenever I think of Nelly Arcan's suicide, I think of the lead singer, Likolak, who killed himself by Sepuku. Sepuku. I think how much it seems like it would hurt, I think about the violence of the act. I could never judge anyone for taking or for considering taking their own life. We all think about doing it. I know that I have, in times of great distress, thought to myself, I am not required to accept this. When family events were particularly dark, I considered it carefully, and knowing the option was a real one brought me some relief. I thought, if I can't really stand it, I'll just do it tomorrow. But it was a huge shock when Nelly Arcand died. She had written about her suicide plan.